Here in Devon, in the tranquil Tamar Valley, is a port that once bustled with industry. Overground, farmers supplied Britain's growing towns and cities with fresh produce. Daffodils set for London. While underground, miners extracted copper and precious minerals. Burning! Now at Morwellham Quay, archaeologists Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn and historian Ruth Goodman are living the lives of Edwardian farmers for a full calendar year. So They're not just farming, but getting to grips with the rural industries that once brought wealth to Devon. Oh, oh wow, we got something. Previously, they resurrected the market garden with hundreds of strawberry plants. In he goes. Oh, it's quite exciting, really. It is exciting. <laughs> Taken on a fresh recruit from the wilds of nearby Dartmoor. Oh, isn't he cute? and welcomed a new addition to their herd of cows. This is the most pleasing part of having a herd, and I'm enormously proud that we've come so far. Now it's May, and with the first hint of summer comes a big opportunity. A very special boat comes to the farm to take produce out and bring tourists in. Come aboard, Morwellum Key, cream teas. Cheers. The team get to grips with new challenges. I am at one with cow now. This is the traditional clotted cream. To capitalise on this summertime bonanza for the Edwardian farm. team are farming red ruby cows, a native Devon breed. Now that a calf has arrived, they want to start milking. But it's not going to be easy, because this herd has never been milked before. Alex has asked for help from local dairy farmer Mary Quick. What do we think about that, Mary? Yeah, there you are. There you are, look. Oh, there you are. Oh, that's OK. That's OK. It comes off. The first step is getting the cow to trust them. If we're going to successfully milk this cow, we've got to be able to get close to her and we've got to control her. There you are. How about that? So what Mary's going to do is she's just trying to get the cow just used to that rope hanging around her. So she knows that she's not trapped. She knows that the rope means feeding time, and that it's all good. You know, she's not used to it, but... No. I think she's telling us where to get off, don't you? Yep. In the 1900s, red rubies were both beef and dairy cows, famous for their creamy milk. But since then, They've been exclusively bred for beef, so aren't used to close contact with people. You know, a lot of people with beef animals, they'll be shouting, they'll be, you know, they'll, yeah. there'll be a lot of running around, sort of cowboy stuff, if you like, and yeah. then you actually can't get to, you know, four or five metres of them. Yeah. But, you know, you rear a dairy cow knowing from the beginning that you're going to yeah. be getting really close to its hooves. Mm. You know, your face is up there yeah. with their back yeah. feet, you know... <laughs> So milking by hands, it's a dangerous affair. Could end in tears. Could end in tears. Yeah. Well, look, if Peter and I can get a bit closer to her, yeah. can tempt her into the milking parlour, can we tempt you yeah. down again to show us how the actual milking process goes? Yeah, happy that, to do that. That would be great. The cow's rich pasture is fed by the River Tamar 
which winds for over 50 miles through rolling countryside. In the 1900s, it was the lifeblood of the valley, and every summer, it brought opportunities for surrounding farms. Oh, this is it. I've been sort of waiting for this, half dreading it, half hoping for it. The paddle steamer Monarch will arrive on Wednesday, 24th of May. Please have cream teas ready. <laughs> That means oodles and oodles and oodles of tourists heading our way. Loads of work. And then again, might be quite a bit of profit too. Throughout the summer months, thousands of tourists flocked to the Tamar Valley. Most came by paddle steamer. These coal-fired boats could take up to 500 passengers, day trippers from nearby places like Plymouth. They danced, played sports, and partied on Norwellum's quayside. Along coasts and rivers, all over Edwardian Britain, paddle steamers are crucial to the tourist trade. But where once there were hundreds, now only three still work. One of them will arrive at Morwellum in a few days' time. So what are we going to need for these tourists, then? Clotted cream, that's what we need. That's what they're expecting. It's Devon, isn't it? Well, right, it's the Devonian <laughs> thing, isn't it? So clotted cream. Devonshire cream tea. We've yep. got a herd of cows. Will your strawberries be ready, do you think? Don't know. If we can keep the pests off them, yeah. and we get a couple of days of good weather, I'm sure we'll have some nice, red, juicy strawberries. I think our strawberries would do better at the market rather than being sold to them. Well, we'll, we'll, be we'll using... maybe have to keep a few back. But the bulk of them we could send up to the market on the paddle steamer, even. I think as long as we can squeeze some money out of these tourists, it'll be good for us, the farm and the valley. So, 24th of May. 24th of May. Why am I remembering that? Because it's on the postcard. It's Empire Day, isn't it? Perhaps we ought to make a thing of that as well, then. Bit of flag waving. Yeah. Empire Day was a huge occasion, marked in British colonies around the world. It would have been even more of a reason for the tourists to celebrate on their day out. If they're to make clotted cream for the festivities, the team must press on with their plans to milk the cow. It's best to do this in a confined space. They've chosen some disused stables. But there's a problem. I knew there was a reason why we shouldn't have kept poultry in here. I mean, being a stable, it's ideal for milking because mm. it's got the stalls. They're there, you can get her in, up against that side. But, of course, as you say, it's absolutely filthy because of all this poultry. The Board of Agriculture and Fisheries leaflets, official advice from the Edwardian period, have a lot to say about conditions in the milking parlour. It says here, cleanliness in the handling of milk and its products is of the utmost importance. Chief sources of contamination of milk are dirt and dust on the cow, yeah. the milker, the air, the water supply, the hay, <laughs> and the dairy utensils. <laughs> so pretty much everywhere. Cleaning, I wouldn't be able to get away with these fingernails. Since time immemorial, they knew that filth in and around dairying meant that the milk wouldn't last. And of course, in the Edwardian period, when milk's, milk's travelling distances of up to 130, 150 miles to get to the city centre, you want that milk to last even longer, so by the time that it gets to the table where it's finally being consumed, it hasn't gone off. Mm. So there's even more reasons then in the Edwardian period to keep the dairy absolutely spotless. Right, well, let's get to it. Let's get to it. John, sure my father would be saying to me right now, start at the top, Alex. Yeah. Work down. <laughs> start at the top. Yes, Dad. Ruth's called on Devon chef Richard Hunt to help her get ready for the tourists. In his job at the Grand Hotel Torquay, Richard serves a thousand cream teas a week. But traditional Devon cream teas weren't served with scones. They came with savoury types of roll that tasted more like bread. One of them was called the cut round. Go on, tell me all about cut rounds. Right, very straightforward, simple ingredients. We go through nice butter, a bit yeah. of farmhouse butter. Nice bit of plain flour. Yeah. Some lovely milk, nice and fresh. Mm -hmm. Some buttermilk. A little bit of milk powder. 
That's, yeah. that's unusual. Well, I'm surprised unusual. by that. It gives it a lighter, fluffier texture. Then obviously the baking powder. And that's it. It's really easy. I mean, these are very similar to scone ingredients, they? Aren't are, they? they are, they are. But basically, the whole idea is it's slightly savoury. Cut rounds were designed to get a bread-like taste quickly. Unlike bread dough, the cut round mix doesn't have to be left to rise, thanks to the special combination of ingredients. I'm going to add buttermilk in buttermilk, there. Buttermilk, yeah, well, yeah. yeah which it's, got, again, it's got a nice flavour, buttermilk. And, it, and what it does, it helps um, just give it an extra bit of rise as well. The acid the works. Acid helps reacts with the, with the, with the baking, baking powder. powder. And you can see how quick it is. It doesn't take very long at all just to long, you know, bring it in. Yeah. Turn it up I noticed, no, you haven't sorted out any roller pins, no cutters. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, what we're going to do now is just roll it into a, a shape. Big fat sausage. Absolutely. No, no messing about here. Nice and simple, nice uh -huh. and easy. And we just cut a nice chunk, you know, and, and press it down. And that is That's quick. It. You know, and, it, and again, they taste fantastic. They're lovely and rustic. You can cut them any size you want, mm. you know, which is really mm. great. You can make that in half an hour, no yeah. problem at all. Right, I'll go and get a tray. Okay, cool. I'm just painting these walls with lime wash. This will just keep this environment totally sterile. Really good. Oh, that's good, doesn't it? Different texture altogether. Yeah. What do you think? That is not a scone, is it? Not by any stretch of the imagination. Actually, it's surprisingly bready. Mmm. That makes a perfect medium for your cream and jam. You know, it's, it's slightly savoury. Yeah, that is good. You could actually eat a lot more cream on that than you could on a scone, couldn't you? Of course, that's what it's all about. <laughs> Having now cleaned out on, our milking parlour, it's time to start introducing the cow to the stall where we're going to milk her. Good girl. Come this is on, where girl. she gets a little Come bit on. suspicious here. You can see it's bright sunlight outside. It's pitch black in there. You know, she really is staring now. She can hear Peter, look, she can hear Peter though. There she goes. There we go. Fantastic, Peter. One cow, one calf in the stall, exactly where we want them. Okay. Next step is full on milking. Particular care should be taken to see that the milkers' clothes are clean and suitable for the purpose. Right. Right, hands clean. Yep. Shirts are clean. Yeah, and the stalls are clean as well. Yeah. So just the headgear on. Right. We'll get up and milk this cow. I do. Let's go. Mary Quick has returned Good. to offer advice on handling on, a cow girl. that's not Good. used to being Good. milked. Good girl. Come on. Good. Yeah, I'm on. You need to keep yourself safe. So, you know, get your hand on her back, first of all. Yeah. So that you can feel if there's a kick developing. Right. And then getting close enough, you know, lean your head against yeah. her flank. So if she does land yeah. a kick on you, it won't hurt very much because it's still Good. quite close to her body. Right. So we've got to get in really quite close. Absolutely. You wuss out and you're, it's your teeth in the fur in your Right. Room. Well, it sounds like Peter's got us stalled, so let's give it Perfect. a go. The cow weighs around half a tonne. There you are, girly. All fine. Mm -hmm. All fine. Hey, good girl. There's a good girl. There you are. There's a good girl. There you are. Ah! Ah! Okay. There you are. Okay. Good girl. Let's just let That's her. okay. Good girl. Let's just. Yeah. Lost a pail? I was You get in there then. There you are. There you are. Oh, she's not letting down. A little bit Ooh. sore just on that. On that. Here. Oh, there you are. It's all okay. It's all okay. There you go. She right. won't let her milk down unless she feels it's all relaxed. Right. She's just letting she's her milk just... down now. She's just relaxing there. That's there brilliant. you are, girl. She's just wondering about life now. I think it's amazing, Mary, that she's, you know, she's yielding up to you. What kind of movement are you using there? Well, you're letting the milk down into the... She's letting the milk down into the teat. Yeah. Then you've got to use your thumb and finger to... Yeah. ..stop it going up. Yeah. 
and then you're using your other fingers to bring it down the teat. Right, Do you want to have a go? I could give it a try, yeah. Now, well, I think uh, if you hold, get yourself so Into she doesn't your detect... your position, yeah? Yeah. So if I just swap... Yeah, that's OK. Oh. There you are, girl. It's all OK. There you are. Okay. If you just keep the pressure keep... on her. Yeah, into here like this. That's right. And get your head, if you get that, your head and shoulder there. That is not... Well, have a go, yeah. There right, you are. yeah. There I'm, you are. I am at one with cow now. Yeah. It's a lovely nice sensation, isn't it? Yeah. How are you finding it, Alex? This is cool. This is cool. This is good. She's a little bit nervous. It's all right. It's all right. She I should keep, keep the pressure on her, even if you stop the milking. Right. It's just your, your weight of your body against yeah. her. She's OK with... That's OK, okay it's OK. It's OK. okay. It's okay. I mean, she's been quite patient, I have to say. Yeah. There you are. Oh, there you maybe are. let's give her five minutes. Yes, you're a good girl, aren't you? Aren't you good? Shh. Aren't you very good? That's the sound of fresh milk. Shall we have a look at it? That's yeah. musical. Now, that's why we put the calico on, is that? Uh, that's right. And but underneath there... Just a largely hair-free yeah. milk. <laughs> How do you think this has gone for a, for a first time? Well, she's been a good girl. Yeah. Mm. She's kicked two or three times. Yeah. Uh, and but you know, good girl. She let her milk down. Yeah. She's um, you know, she's she she she's good natured. But this isn't hasn't ever been her game before. So you you could make this happen. Yeah. You know whether her breeding will give a lot of milk. I suppose Pure since beef. they were used as milkers, they've been bred more towards the beef and away from yeah. dairy. Absolutely. Mm. Right. You know, generations yeah. of breeding. I think we can let that calf have the rest of the milk for tea, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's time to get the muzzle off. Yeah. yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Back to the Come on. Come on, girl. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Well, really well, actually. It did. It's not the quantity, it is the quality. Quantity? You mean there isn't very much? Is it's, this it? Uh, no, there's slightly more, but not much more. That's rich, isn't it? So do you think we're going to get enough, or am I going to have to buy in some other milk for the clotted cream? I think if you're wanting to entertain large numbers of people, we're going to have yeah. to get in some extra milk. What about the strawberries? How are we doing on those? Well, I should head off, actually, and go and check to see if we've uh, managed to keep those slugs off of the plants. Right. OK. Paddle steamers were often used to take produce to market, particularly strawberries, which are a lucrative crop in the summer months. Alex is planning to put his strawberries on the steamer when it arrives. But first, he's got to do battle in the market garden. It's May time and all of Morwellham Key is in bloom. But of course, May is the month in which if you take your eye off the ball, everything could go wrong. All of that hard work you've put in throughout the autumn and winter months could go to waste because the weeds can take over as well as the insects. And if you don't sort things in May, by June, it's too late. Alex has a plan to get rid of the slugs and snails. Oh. Yeah, now. Ah. Oh. I'm going to bring down into the market garden possibly the farm's greediest occupants, Aylesbury duck. Here we go. Ah. Here we are. Oh. Come here, you. This is the drake, known as Sir Francis in these parts of the world. He's a greedy little fellow, though, and there's his duck. And anyone who's kept Aylesbury ducks will know that they have an insatiable appetite for slugs and snails. And I'm going to put that appetite to work here on the lowest terrace of the walled garden, and they'll be able to feed their fat, hungry bellies on all the various slugs and snails that have occupied all of these walls and currently lie underneath stones and are, as I speak, probably working their way towards 
our budding strawberry crop. The Board of Agriculture leaflets are packed with advice on strawberries. They recommend using a mix of lime and caustic soda to ward off pests. Now, lime, as we know, is in itself a very caustic substance. And with the caustic soda mixed into it, it makes it especially potent. So the slug and snails have a sort of very fine film of mucus-like substance all over their bodies. And when that stuff comes into contact with this, it'll cause them to burn. So as soon as they come anywhere near it with their little tentacles, they'll immediately recoil and head off in the other direction. So we'll just put a little bit of this in as well. Extra specially caustic for my little sluggy wuggy friends. I think what I'll try and do is make a sort of perimeter fence. No slugs on my patch. <laughs> Here they are. Hello. <laughs> Ruth's drafted in some experts to help her make the clotted cream for the tourists. You made it, fantastic. <laughs> what a load of stuff as well. Goodness me. Across Edwardian Britain, Travelling dairy schools operated in several counties. Lynn Thompson from the Open University has studied them. <laughs> Most decorously done. <laughs> Hello. Hi. I'm Ruth. How lovely to meet you. This is our schoolroom, yes. so um, do you want to come and have a look yes. and see if it'll do the job? Yeah. Dairying was traditionally women's right. work, so most of the pupils were female. No, it would be okay. So what exactly was a travelling dairy school? It was part of something called agricultural extension. And it was the means whereby women, children in villages, with some knowledge of dairying, were able to avail themselves of the most up-to-date techniques, which would include butter making, cheese making, and clotted cream as well. Dairy schools were a largely government-funded attempt to tackle a serious problem. Many Edwardian dairy farmers were using outdated techniques leading to patchy, inconsistent produce. They couldn't compete with cheaper, factory-made imports. Dairy schools were set up to raise British standards. Are we learning new actual dairying techniques, or is it more about refining the things that an ordinary person might already know? It's really applying a little bit more science basically. Right. So there's a bit of both. There's applying new techniques, but it's also to do with packaging and making things more attractive. Um, what the market will bear, what the market will buy. The first county council-run dairy schools were set up in the 1890s. By the end of the Edwardian period, they'd reached thousands of women in rural communities. But of course, the very best advertisement is word of mouth, and villages would talk to other villages adjacently uh, about what had happened, and they'd had a dairy school, where the word travelled, and they became, in many respects, quite popular. Today, I'm going to show you how to make clotted cream. The whole process takes uh, over three days. Prize-winning clotted cream maker Margaret Burra has come to teach the class the tricks of the trade. Well, my family have been making cream for more years than I care to remember. <laughs> and this lady there, there is attending a dairy school, <laughs> and she was my great aunt. She got hair just like mine. <laughs> <laughs> So we're in character. <laughs> Margaret starts with a pan of milk that's been allowed to stand overnight. It's a big wide bowl rather than a straight little Yes, jug. because you don't want it, you don't want that thickness of cream, you want that thickness of cream. I'm now putting the bowl of milk, which has been stood since yesterday, into the bowl of hot water just under boiling. It acts like a bain marie, and this will take three quarters of an hour to an hour to cook the cream. And 
notice you were doing that really carefully. I suppose having spent all that time settling the two out, you don't want to mix them up you again. You don't want to break the surface. The, the smoother you can keep the surface, the better. As it cooks, the cream becomes bubbly and crusty. This one is just about done now. And if you bend down, can you see these bubbles beginning? Oh, great big ones on yes, the surface. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. And the side, around the side of the bowl, oh, yeah. it's almost beginning to lift. To sort of try and pull away, yeah. Yes. Yes, I can see that, actually. That is indicating that it really is just about just done. Just about there. Just about done. And I shall now take it off and put it back on a cool slab and leave it until tomorrow. Right. It's quite a simple process then, right. isn't it? Yes. I tell you what, it looks really golden and delicious. The paddle steam will arrive in four days. But while the team prepare, work on the farm must go on. It's going. It's gone. Earlier in the year, they planted a field of potatoes. It's in danger of being taken over by weeds. I'm really, really nervous about this. Right. This could all go horribly, horribly wrong. Do you want to um, step him forward? Alex is using a scuffler. Its blades uproot weeds as it moves along the rows. But if handled incorrectly, it can also cut out potato plants. Just taken out two or three plants there. I mean, it, it could be going better. I'm just going to take out some more there. I am staying in the drills, trying not to damage the plants too much. But it's a pretty exhausting state of affairs. And my worry is, look, there, this is what I'm worried about. If I go along and keep knocking out potential potatoes, I'm going to run into problems, OK? Certainly getting rid of the weeds, which was the goal. Yeah. The sheep also need help fighting pests. May is always a very difficult month for the shepherd because he's got sheep out there that he really wants to shear because it's, it's so hot and, of course, the insects are all hatching out and coming to life. But at the same time, at night, the temperature can drop to below freezing. And if you've sheared your sheep, you can put them in all kinds of trouble if you get some really cold weather. So it's a difficult month, a difficult window, really. OK, Peter, are you ready? Alex has mixed up a drench containing tobacco leaves and sulphur. Our first customer. Apply this to the sheep's flank into her back and the nicotine in the tobacco is actually very poisonous <laughs> to all of the mites and parasites that are living in there and the sulfur as well then acts as a repellent. In 1905 the government issued the sheep scab order and it has lots of details about drenching sheep and the kind of mixtures you should use to prevent the most injurious of all the parasites, which creates a scab on the skin of the sheep. And of course, that scab is not only bad for the sheep, but it's also bad for the fleece because they scratch away at it and they actually cause baldness. So when you come to shearing, all you're left with is little straggly bits instead of a nice, whole, complete fleece. So that should look after them for about a few weeks. It should do, and hopefully they'll be ready to shear by then. Yeah. I seem to have more drench on me than those sheep have on them. <laughs> well, keep the parasites down. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> awesome. In the dairy school, Ruth's learning the final part of clotted cream making, so she'll be ready when the tourists arrive. This is one that I cooked yesterday, so we've come to the point now where we're going to skim the cream and put it into the glass bowls. So I gently lower the skimmer under the surface of the cream. A 
and you hold it for a second if there's any surplus milk to drain off and then place it into the bowl let it slide off the skimmer in one piece. <laughs> Traditionally made cream would have fetched a premium with Edwardian consumers. It's presented in a very particular way. Now the idea with farmhouse cream, which is cream set over milk, is to try and present your cream with as many layers of crust as possible. Right, it's a very different product from the sort of thing you buy in the shop, isn't it? Very. There, I've now put in the final slice, and as you can see, it looks nice and smooth on the surface, which is quite good presentation. Right. That's it. That's your layers That's... of clotted cream. Ooh. Could I try a bit, you think? That'd be all right. <laughs> of course you may. I'd love to. I guess... I'll be interested to hear what you... Yeah. Um, How different it is from the... Oh, that is different, isn't it? <laughs> mm. I'm hoping we're going to have a lot of tourists descending on us. So uh, I'm thinking about, you know, what sort of thing they will like, whether I can serve it to them and sell it to them. Oh, yes. You <laughs> possibly make a little money serving cream teas or using I it I think somewhere. my cream will be a heck of a lot better for having spent the day with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> With the pests under control, there's one more urgent task for Alex to attend to. One of our most important jobs on the farm at present is the working of the pony. Vladdy is the farm's newest recruit. Until two months ago, he lived wild on Dartmoor. Okay. The team are training him to work the farm. But first, they have to build up a close relationship with him. He must learn to respond to their verbal commands. Good boy, welcome. Walk on. 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 Come on, walk on. That was almost a half turn of this ring, so we're getting there. Alex needs to be careful not to push the training too far. One of my many faults is that I'm, I'm terribly impatient because, of course, the danger in hurrying things, if I tried to get him to do something that he just wasn't too happy about, I could really upset the apple cart and always associate that job with some kind of trauma, and I don't want to do that, you know, I don't want to rush him. He's part of the family here. To earn his keep on the farm, Laddie must get used to carrying weight. It's possible, just possible, but very soon we'll be able to drape some panniers over his back. So far, so good. I'm pleased. What about you, fella? You pleased? You looking forward to doing some work? It'd be fun, wouldn't it? We'll go on some adventures, can't we? There are just two days to go before the paddle steamer arrives. Ruth's making decorations fit for Empire Day. Of 
Alex is taking no chances with the strawberries. And Peter's getting started on another product for the tourists. Images of beauty spots were a popular souvenir, so he's decided to do a series of drawings. First, he's got to make his materials. He's chosen pastels. OK. So pastels are just chalk to pad them out. Which is this. OK. And then pigment, which is the clever bit. Purple, blue. In the 19th century, advances in chemistry created a rich new palette of pigments for paint. I mean, look at that. Is that blue or is that blue? It's hard to look at, isn't it? It's just it's so intense. Many of them were made with lead, so were poisonous when breathed in. Nevertheless, they were embraced by artists such as Van Gogh. You know, there we go, Van Gogh's sunflower screaming at you. Yeah. It is such a colour, isn't it? It's fabulous. It's odd, isn't it? We tend to think of art history only in terms of sort of... Stylistically. Um, st exactly. Yeah. Instead of remembering that there's also all this technical stuff, that if you don't get the chemistry, you can't have the... you can't have that. The pigment and chalk are bound together with gum water, which acts like glue. I can just see these colours turning up in the picture of our valley. Don't need your pastels perfect, do you? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> there we go. All that dried out and transfer onto the paper. I think they're going to be ideal. For his drawings of the valley, Peter's taking inspiration from a remarkable first hand source. This is a, um, a visitor's book from a local farm that took in B&Bs. I mean, the visitors, they haven't just written, thank you very much for our stay, they've annotated it with. Drawings, stories, poems. That's just amazing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, what's, what's the date on that one? Is there a date? 30th of September, 04. 04. I mean, the sort of quality of artwork in there is consistently brilliant, and it's all different people. So it sort of emphasises the kind of artistic skill of just the people of the time. It's Cameras are only just coming in, aren't they? Yeah, I suppose it's how you capture your memories, yeah. isn't it? I mean, we, yeah. have, we have people from not just all over the country, all over yeah. the world. Really? I mean, there's, there's Kuala Lumpur in there. Kuala <laughs> Lumpur. There's, there's Egypt. Gosh. That was really sweet, the little picture of the heather, too. It's things like this. This is, this is history. It is, isn't it? This is a primary source from our era of actual people who turned up and had a, a good had time. Had a good time in Devon. Well, I was... Um, thinking I might give it a go myself. I think it's a really nice idea. I think you should. This is gorgeous. So it's all about light changing, seasons changing. Local artist Ryan Rogers has come to give Peter some tips. And these are more well rocks. More well rock. Yay. And the view Look is at that. fabulous. Always takes your breath away, doesn't it? Now, you're quite an experienced artist, obviously. I don't uh, think I've really done any art since I was about 12. Well, that uh, sh shouldn't stop you. So do you sort of frame it up, then? The way I would do it is I decide where my eye is going to look at the middle of the composition. This is where I'm going. This, this amazing shape that the river describes. Yeah. And then above that, there are all those woods, and then we just go right a little bit, and then we've got this punctuation mark of the chimney there. And then um, there's a lot of land to get in here because we're looking downwards, so there won't be a lot of sky, which is a shame, really, because the skies in the Tamar are just extraordinary. Well, yeah, the, the sunsets are absolutely spectacular. The most famous artist to paint the Tamar Valley was Turner, who visited in the early 19th century. He inspired many others to follow him. Was it, is it Turner, when he was painting here, said never in a, anywhere else had he found so many natural beauties in one spot, I think? He did say that, yeah. Uh, and I think Turner and certainly the 
people who followed in his footsteps for painting uh, found that. The way the layout of the valley, the geography of the valley, it charmed them. How are you getting with those pastels, Peter? Hey, they're, they're, they're quite good, yeah. So do you think the second, you're going to make another batch? <sighs> oh, definitely, yeah. Bigger palette? Bigger palette, indeed. I think I'll make some more, more colours. <laughs> I think this is going to do brilliantly. With the tourists coming, you know, I don't just want to sell them cream teas. I think I want to sell them absolutely anything and everything. In all the sort of nooks and crannies of the market gardens, there's any number of flowers that just sort of turn up. Wildflowers were really fashionable in the Edwardian period. There was a sort of a bit of a move against cultivated and hothouse, particularly hothouse blooms. Wild blooms were considered to be much more feminine, much more natural. things to be remembered, of course, when you're doing this is that many Edwardians were really quite interested in the idea of a language of flowers. Each flower was supposed to have a different meaning, so you could put together a whole symphony of ideas in what you had in your bouquet. The daffodil symbolises regret, whereas the bluebells were widely thought to be constancy. Roses, unsurprisingly, either mean love or beauty. Whereas the Granny's Bonnets, or Columbine, which are one of my favourite flowers, they're supposed to symbolise desertion. My love has deserted me. At a time, you know, when it was really quite hard to court openly, to declare one's feelings for somebody else, this was quite a nice, discreet way of doing it. Not everybody knew the code. You could misunderstand it deliberately if you wanted to. It sort of gave people options. <laughs> the countdown to the paddle steamer's arrival has begun. This is the Cowstock Viaduct. It was built during the boarding period. In the cottage, Ruth's rustling up one final treat for the tourists. The ice I ordered has arrived. So I'm using this to make ice cream. Ice cream was surprisingly available in Edwardian Britain. For the second half of the 19th century, Ice was being imported into Britain from all over the world. Ships would sail to places like Norway or northern Canada and chip off huge, great pieces of glacier or whatever, load them into the ships and bring them across the Atlantic. OK, now I'm going to check what Mrs Marshall tells me to do next. Clever lady she is. Ruth's using a recipe by Agnes Marshall the era's foremost authority on frozen desserts. Basic. I've made my basic custard mix. It's there. Her recipe involves freezing custard to turn it into ice cream. But she didn't confine herself to writing books. What a businesswoman this woman was. She ran a cookery school and she also like, developed a range of products that um, she could flog to people. Um, there is indeed a, a patent freezing tub there are special ice safes, or almost like fridges, for keeping ices in. Um, a whole range of moulds as well for making more elaborate things. There's no way, of course, that, you know, somebody like us could possibly afford all this fancy equipment for ice cream making, so I'm just sort of making it up with what I've got. Ice alone isn't cold enough to freeze the custard. So Ruth's using a chemical reaction to achieve the temperature she needs. Clever stuff happens when you mix crushed ice with salt. 
not being a chemist, I had to look this up. Apparently, the, the, in the, the, the salt crystal itself, when it dissolves in water, the bonds break apart, but that requires energy, so it drags energy in the form of heat out of the water. So if you add salt to ice, you take it down six degrees below freezing point, and therefore you've got the same sort of temperature as a freezer. I need about half the volume of salt as I have of ice. There it goes. Listen. That's the freezing. Is the reaction already happening. I just think this is so groovy. And I've got a flat bottomed metal vessel so that I can transfer the cold in as much as possible. And it should start. Cool. The freezing process takes around five minutes. Ooh, and I can even feel it. It's no longer a runny liquid. It's starting to go sort of jelly-like. It's just like magic, isn't it? Ah, wonderful. Ice cream. The strawberries are ready to pick. This is the day, this is the day we have been waiting for. There's certainly enough for a good 20 pounds of strawberries here, so we're going to go for it. We've managed to keep the worst of the snails and the slugs off of the crop. We've also managed to keep the birds off of the crop. OK, we'll have one. Okay, because these are all for market. But I've got to make sure that these things are going to sell. <laughs> okay. These could be bitter. So choose, and choose wisely. Go on, you, you have, have that, that one. one. You have that one. I'll have a smaller one. There we are. Here it is. That is delicious. Oh. I do wish I hadn't done that. Mm. I really wish I hadn't done that. Because it's going to be an effort not to do that again. Oh. <laughs> it really sort of gets right into the cheeks, doesn't it? Mm. Sweetness. And you can imagine that sweetness after a barren winter of sort of pickled, dried and salted foods all of a sudden to be chucking into something as delicious and sweet as that. Whoa, it's got me salivating. Right. Strawberries were always carefully packed for a trip on the paddle steamer. This is a half pound punnet. Up in London, these are fetching three shillings a pound, OK? So with that crate alone, we are looking at something in the region of between 30 to 36 shillings, OK? And when you think about the lowest paid workers in the countryside getting between 10 and 15 shillings a week for their wages, just tells you how important this industry was to the Tamar Valley and how important it would be to us as Edwardian farmers. There's a lot of money there, Peter. There is a lot of money. Oh, a good one here. God. Let's get these strawberries on that paddle steam. Monarch is one of only three working paddle steamers in Britain. That looks fantastic. Wow, look at that. Hi. Ahoy there. I'd be wanting a trip up and down the river on that. <laughs> wow. They're going to need a hand with these ropes here. It's been more than 80 years since a boat like this came to Morwellum Quay. Monarch's first job will be taking the strawberries to market. Peter and Alex will go with them and then entice tourists back to the farm. So I'm relying on you two, your silver tongues. Bring us as many tourists as possible. I don't think we'll need verbal skills with a vessel like this. Look at you up there, Alex. No, I don't know. <laughs> Got hard work going to these. <laughs> Time to relax. Good luck. All right, are we ready? We're ready. Good, let's go. Beep. 
Monarch's engine is around 100 years old. Her skipper is Matto Crowley. It's an ideal vessel for this sort of thing because, like the Tamar Valley, it's lined with profits for somebody. But this is a very fast-flowing river. Um, it's very, very difficult to get up if the, if the wind is, is a bit light. Um, the paddle steamer is reliable, it's easy power, and, um, and it did the job. The, the pleasure steamers that went to the beaches, a lot of them were designed to literally drive at full steam right up onto the beach, load the passengers off the bow, and, um, and back straight back. So it's, um, it's good stuff. You know, at the end of the day, if you look back and you look at the wake, and the little ripples going to the bank, how can you not like it? Um, it's like one of three paddle steamer skippers left in this country. Um, and it's rather nice to be able to say that and, and know that we're keeping a tradition alive. Peter! Yeah? Tourists, in the wave! Come aboard. Please, please come this way. Wellam Key, cream teas. First of the season. Hopefully the first of many. Sorry about the mud. Right, all aboard. Fantastic. Ruth setting up for the patriotic cream teas. Empire Day is an Edwardian invention. It was actually, you know, made up from scratch in 1904. Caught on really fast. Within a couple of years, almost every school in Britain, almost every community was busily celebrating Empire Day. The day was chosen because it was Queen Victoria's birthday, so there's a bit of harking back to the good old days. It was designed to be um, sort of a, something to bring everybody in the empire together so that all citizens, whether they be here or in the far-flung reaches, would sort of be reminded of each other, reminded of the greatness, reminded of their responsibilities to each other within the empire. Paddle steamer trips could often be rowdy affairs. It is Empire Day, so I think we can drink as much or as little as this we like. Cheers! Cheers! Devon folk musician Mick Bramich has come to provide some onboard entertainment. Right, we all know the chorus, don't we? Yes. Famous local song. So here we go. As I was going to Strawberry Fair, right on, right on, little toggle I done. I spied a fair maid of beauty, rare toggle me. I spied a fair maid and selling her where as she went on to Strawberry Fair. Right on, right on, little toggle I done. That's all right on, little toggle me. was the heyday of paddle steamer trips on the Tamar. Up to 500 tourists at a time came to places like Morwellum, and villagers cashed in on their insatiable appetite for cream teas. Richard Hunters returned to give his verdict on Ruth's effort. Have a big bite of this one. <laughs> mm. 
Oh, the cream's lovely. I think so. Not Up to fantastic. standard. Mmm. That lovely rich flavour, you know. Everything about it is different. They're very yellow and golden and tastes great. Mmm. You know, it's a real indulgence. I'm a convert. I'm moving over to cut rounds from scones, definitely. <laughs> No, that reminds me of childhood holidays down here in the West Country. I've already had two, so... Have you? Yeah. There's no rule against having three. <laughs> Would anyone like an ice cream? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I've only started literally right. the other day with pastels. I, I, I think that's really interesting. I think you can have it, to be honest. Today is Empire Day. And in commemoration of this event, be upstanding for the national anthem. Oh, that one's still warm, Ruth. There oh. we are. Oh. Oh. Take the weight off your feet. <laughs> Stop sweeping me! Well, that was successful. Yeah, it needs to be. That was a sort of tourist harvest, really. Tourist <laughs> harvest. Tourist <laughs> harvest. <laughs> we now have the summer to look forward to. Mm. So, Good. Oh, we've still got some clotted cream left, Peter. I'll eat that later. More strawberries, too. I'll eat those later. <laughs> Next time on Edwardian Farm, it's June. Time for sheep to go up to Dartmoor. Here! Come! Come! A lesson in how to profit from Devon's once booming wool industry. I'm just finding this really nerve-wracking, actually. Is that fine? <laughs> and old friends drop in. Oh, there they are! Oh, they are. My goodness, you know how to arrive in style.